Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Alien Film Alien is a 1979 science fiction horror film directed by Ridley Scott, and starring Sigourney Weaver, Tom Skerritt, Veronica Cartwright, Harry Dean Stanton, John Hurt, Ian Holm, and Yafet Kotto. It is the first movie in what became a large Alien franchise. The film's title refers to a highly aggressive extraterrestrial creature that stalks and attacks the crew of a spaceship. Dan O'Bannon Drawing upon previous works of science fiction and horror, wrote the screenplay from a story he co-authored with Ronald Shusett. The film was produced by Gordon Carroll, David Gyler and Walt Hill through their company Brandywine Productions, and was distributed by 20th Century Fox. Gyler and Hill revised and made additions to the script. Shusett was executive producer. The eponymous Alien and its accompanying elements were designed by the Swiss artist H.R. Giger, while concept artists Ron Cobb and Chris Foss designed the more human aspects of the film. Alien was released on May 25, 1979 in the United States and September 6 in the United Kingdom. It was met with critical acclaim and found box office success, winning the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects three Saturn Awards, and a Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, along with numerous other nominations. It has been consistently praised in the years since its release, and is considered one of the greatest films of all time. In 2002, Alien was deemed culturally, historically or aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress and was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry. In 2008, it was ranked by the American Film Institute as the seventh best film in the science fiction genre, and as the 33rd greatest film of all time, by Empire Magazine. The success of Alien spawned a media franchise of novels, comic books, video games, and toys. It also launched Weaver's acting career, providing her with her first lead role. The story of her character Ellen Ripley's encounters with the alien creatures became the thematic and narrative core of the sequels Aliens, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection. A crossover with the Predator franchise produced the Alien vs. Predator films, which includes Alien vs. Predator and Aliens vs. Predator, Requiem. A prequel series includes Prometheus and Alien, Covenant. Plot the commercial space tug Nostromo is on a return trip to Earth with a seven-member crew in stasis. Captain Dallas, Executive Officer Kane, Warrant Officer Ripley, Navigator Lambert, Science Officer Rash and two engineers, Parker, and Brett. Detecting a transmission from the nearby planetoid LV-426, the ship's computer, Mother, awakens the crew. Company policy requires crews to investigate such transmissions. So they land on the planetoid, sustaining damage from its atmosphere and rocky landscape. Parker and Brett repair the ship while Dallas, Kane, and Lambert head out to investigate. They discover the signal comes from a derelict alien spacecraft and head inside it, losing communication with Ash. Inside, they find the remains of a large alien creature. Ripley deciphers part of the transmission, determining it's not a distress signal, but a warning of some kind. In the spacecraft, Kane discovers a chamber containing hundreds of large egg-like objects. When he touches one, it opens and a creature springs out and attaches to his face through the face mask of his spacesuit. Dallas and Lambert carry the unconscious Kane back to the Nostromo. As acting senior officer, Ripley refuses to let them aboard, citing quarantine regulations, but Ash ignores Ripley and lets them in. The crew unsuccessfully attempt to remove the creature from Kane's face discovering that its blood is an extremely corrosive acid. It later detaches on its own and is found dead. The ship is partly repaired, and the crew lifts off. Kane awakens with some memory loss, but otherwise unharmed. During a final crew meal before returning to stasis, he chokes and convulses in pain, then dies as a small alien creature bursts from his chest, and escapes into the ship. The crew attempts to locate it with a tracking device and capture or kill it with nets electric prods and flamethrowers, Brett follows the crew's cat, Jones, into an engine room and the now fully grown alien attacks him and disappears with his body into an air shaft. After heated discussion, the crew decide the creature must be in the air ducts. Dallas enters the ducts, intending to force the alien into the airlock, but it ambushes him. Lambert implores the others to abandon ship and escape in its small shuttle. 
now in command, Ripley explains that the shuttle will not support four people and pushes to continue with Dallas' plan of flushing out the alien. Now with access to Mother, Ripley discovers that Ash has been secretly ordered to return the alien to the company, with the crew deemed expendable. Ripley confronts Ash and he tries to choke her to death. Parker intervenes and clubs Ash, knocking off his head and revealing him to be an android. Parker reanimates Ash's head and they learn he was assigned to the Nostromo to ensure the creature was returned for analysis at any expense, including the crew's lives. Ash taunts them about their chances against the perfect organism. Ripley disconnects Sash, and Parker burns his smashed remains with a flamethrower. Ripley, Lambert, and Parker agree to self-destruct the Nostromo, and escape in the shuttle. Parker and Lambert are killed by the alien while gathering life support supplies. Ripley initiates the self-destruct sequence and heads with the cat to the shuttle to find the alien in her path. She retreats, and attempts unsuccessfully to abort the self-destruct. She returns to the shuttle, where the alien is gone and she narrowly escapes in the shuttle as the Nostromo explodes. As she prepares for stasis, Ripley finds the alien has stowed away aboard the shuttle. She puts on a spacesuit and opens the shuttle's airlock. The explosive decompression forces the alien into the airlock doorway. She shoots it with a grappling hook to propel it into space. But the gun catches as the airlock closes, tethering the alien to the shuttle. It attempts to crawl into one of the engines, but Ripley fires them, to blast the alien into space. After recording the voyage final log entry, she places herself and the cat into stasis for the trip home to Earth. Development While studying cinema at the University of Southern California, Dan O'Bannon had made a science fiction comedy film, Dark Star, with director John Carpenter and concept artist Ron Cobb. The film featured an alien created by spray painting a beach ball. The experience left a Bannon, really wanting to do an alien that looked real. A couple of years later he began work on a similar story that would focus more on horror. I knew I wanted to do a scary movie on a spaceship with a small number of astronauts. He later recalled Dark Star as a horror movie instead of a comedy. Ronald Shusett, meanwhile, was working on an early version of what would eventually become Total Recall. Impressed by Dark Star, he contacted O'Bannon and the two agreed to collaborate on their projects, choosing to work on O'Bannon's film first as they believed it would be less costly to produce. O'Bannon had written 29 pages of a script titled Memory, containing what would become the opening scenes of Alien, a crew of astronauts awaken to find that their voyage has been interrupted because they are receiving a signal from a mysterious planetoid. They investigate, and their ship breaks down on the surface. He did not yet, however, have a clear idea as to what the alien antagonist of the story would be. O'Bannon soon accepted an offer to work on Alejandro Jodorowsky's adaptation of Dune, a project which took him to Paris for six months. Though the project ultimately fell through, it introduced him to several artists whose work gave him ideas for his science fiction story including Chris Foss, H. R. Giger, and Jean. Mobius, Giraud. O'Bannon was impressed by Foss's covers for science fiction books. While he found Giga's work disturbing, his paintings had a profound effect on me. I had never seen anything that was quite as horrible and at the same time as beautiful as his work. And so I ended up writing a script about a Giga monster. After the Dune project collapsed, O'Bannon returned to Los Angeles to live with Shusit, and the two revived his memory script. Shusit suggested that O'Bannon use one of his other film ideas, about gremlins infiltrating a B-17 bomber during World War II, and set it on the spaceship as the second half of the story. The working title of the project was now Star Beast. But O'Bannon disliked this and changed it to Alien after noting the number of times that the word appeared in the script. He and Shusit liked the new title's simplicity and its double meaning as both a noun and an adjective. Shusit came up with the idea that one of the crew members could be implanted with an alien embryo that would burst out of him. He thought this would be an interesting plot device by which the alien could get aboard the ship. In writing the script, O'Bannon drew inspiration from many previous works of science fiction and horror. He later stated that, I didn't steal alien from anybody, I stole it from everybody. The thing from another world inspired the idea of professional men being pursued by a deadly alien creature through a claustrophobic environment. Forbidden Planet gave O'Bannon the idea of a ship being warned not to land. 
and then the crew being killed one by one by a mysterious creature when they defy the warning. Planet of the Vampires contains a scene in which the heroes discover a giant alien skeleton. This influenced the Nostromo crew's discovery of the alien creature in the derelict spacecraft. O'Bannon has also noted the influence of Junkyard, a short story by Clifford D. Simak in which a crew lands on an asteroid and discovers a chamber full of eggs. He has also cited as influences Strange Relations by Philip Jose Farmer, which covers alien reproduction, and various EC Comics horror titles carrying stories in which monsters eat their way out of people. With most of the plot in place, Shusit and O'Bannon presented their script to several studios, pitching it as Jaws in Space. They were on the verge of signing a deal with Roger Corman's studio when a friend offered to find them a better deal and pass the script on to Gordon Carroll, David Jyla, and Walter Hill, who had formed a production company called Brandywine with ties to 20th Century Fox. O'Bannon and Shusett signed a deal with Brandywine, but Hill and Jyla were not satisfied with the script and made numerous rewrites and revisions. This caused tension with O'Bannon and Shusett, since Hill and Jyla had very little experience with science fiction. According to Shusit, they weren't good at making it better, or, in fact, at not making it even worse. O'Bannon believed that Hill and Jyla were attempting to justify taking his name off of the script and claiming his and Shusit's work as their own. Hill and Jyla did add some substantial elements to the story, however, including the android character Ash, which O'Bannon felt was an unnecessary subplot but which Shusit later described as one of the best things in the movie. The whole idea and scenario was theirs. Hill and Jylo went through eight drafts of the script in total, concentrating largely on the Ash subplot, but also making the dialogue more natural and trimming some sequences set on the alien planetoid. Despite the fact that the final shooting script was written by Hill and Jylo, the Writers Guild of America awarded O'Bannon sole credit for the screenplay. Despite these rewrites, 20th Century Fox did not express confidence in financing a science fiction film. However, after the success of Star Wars in 1977 the studio's interest in the genre rose substantially. According to Carroll, when Star Wars came out, and was the extraordinary hit that it was, suddenly science fiction became the hot genre. O'Bannon recalled that, they wanted to follow through on Star Wars, and they wanted to follow through fast and the only spaceship script they had sitting on their desk was Alien. Alien was greenlit by 20th Century Fox, with an initial budget of $4.2 million. Alien was funded by North Americans, but made by 20th Century Fox's British production subsidiary. Direction O'Bannon had originally assumed that he would direct Alien, but 20th Century Fox instead asked Hill to direct. Hill declined due to other film commitments as well as not being comfortable with the level of visual effects that would be required. Peter Yates, Jack Clayton, and Robert Aldridge were considered for the task, but O'Bannon, Shusit, and the Brandywine team felt that these directors would not take the film seriously and would instead treat it as a B-monster movie. Jyla, Hill, and Carol had been impressed by Ridley Scott's debut feature film The Duelists and made an offer to him to direct Alien, which Scott quickly accepted. Scott created detailed storyboards for the film in London, which impressed 20th Century Fox enough to double the film's budget. His storyboards included designs for the spaceship and space suits, drawing on such films as 2001, A Space Odyssey, and Star Wars. However, he was keen on emphasizing horror and alien rather than fantasy, describing the film as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of science fiction. O'Bannon introduced Scott to the artwork of H. R. Giger. Both of them felt that his painting Necronum IV was the type of representation they wanted for the film's antagonist and began asking the studio to hire him as a designer. 20th Century Fox initially believed Giger's work was too ghastly for audiences, but the Brandywine team were persistent, and eventually won out. According to Gordon Carroll, the first second that Ridley saw Giger's work, he knew that the biggest single design problem maybe the biggest problem in the film, had been solved. Scott flew to Zurich to meet Giger and recruited him to work on all aspects of the alien and its environment including the surface of the planetoid, the derelict spacecraft, and all four forms of the alien from the egg to the adult. Casting 
Casting calls and auditions for Alien were held in both New York and London. With only seven human characters in the story, Scott sought to hire strong actors so he could focus most of his energy on the film's visual style. He employed casting director Mary Selway, who had worked with him on The Duelists, to head the casting in the United Kingdom, while Mary Goldberg handled casting in the United States. In developing the story, O'Bannon had focused on writing the alien first, putting off developing the other characters. He and Shusett had intentionally written all the roles generically. They made a note in the script that explicitly states, the crew is unisex, and all parts are interchangeable for men or women. This freed Scott, Selway, and Goldberg to interpret the characters as they pleased, and to cast accordingly. They wanted the Nostromo's crew to resemble working astronauts in a realistic environment, a concept summarized as truckers in space. According to Scott, this concept was inspired partly by Star Wars, which deviated from the pristine future often depicted in science fiction films of the time. To assist the actors in preparing for their roles, Scott wrote several pages of backstory for each character explaining their histories. He filmed many of their rehearsals in order to capture spontaneity and improvisation, and tensions between some of the cast members, particularly towards the less experienced Weaver. This translated convincingly to film as tension between the characters. Roger Ebert notes that the actors in Alien were older than was typical in thriller films at the time, which helped make the characters more convincing. None of them were particularly young. Tom Skerritt, the captain, was 46, Hurt was 39, but looked older, Holm was 48, Harry Dean Stanton was 53, Yafet Cotto was 42, and only Veronica Cartwright at 30 and Weaver at 29 were in the age range of the usual thriller cast. Many recent action pictures have improbably young actors cast as key roles or sidekicks, but by skewing older, Alien achieves a certain texture without even making a point of it. These are not adventurers, but workers, hired by a company, to return 20 million tons of ore to Earth. David McKinty, author of Beautiful Monsters, the unofficial and unauthorized guide to the Alien and Predator films, asserts that part of the film's effectiveness in frightening viewers comes from the fact that the audience can all identify with the characters. Everyone aboard the Nostromo is a normal, everyday, working Joe just like the rest of us. They just happen to live and work in the future. Filming Alien was filmed over 14 weeks from July 5 to October 21, 1978. Principal photography took place at Shepperton Studios near London, while model and miniature filming was done at Bray Studios in Water Oakley, Berkshire. The production schedule was short due to the film's low budget and pressure from 20th Century Fox to finish on time. A crew of over 200 craftspeople and technicians constructed the three principal sets, the surface of the alien planetoid, and the interiors of the Nostromo, and the derelict spacecraft. Art director Ladilly created scale miniatures of the planetoid's surface and derelict spacecraft based on Giga's designs, then made molds and casts and scaled them up as diagrams for the wood and fiberglass forms of the sets. Tons of sand, plaster, fiberglass, rock, and gravel were shipped into the studio to sculpt a desert landscape for the planetoid's surface, which the actors would walk across wearing spacesuit costumes. The suits themselves were thick, bulky, and lined with nylon, had no cooling systems and, initially, no venting for their exhaled carbon dioxide to escape. Combined with a heat wave, these conditions nearly caused the actors to pass out. Nurses had to be kept on hand with oxygen tanks. For scenes showing the exterior of the Nostromo, a 58-feet landing leg was constructed to give a sense of the ship's size. Ridley Scott was not convinced that it looked large enough, so he had his two young sons and the son of Derek Von Lindt stand in. For the regular actors, wearing smaller space suits to make the set pieces seem larger, the same technique was used for the scene in which the crew members encounter the dead alien creature in the derelict spacecraft. The children nearly collapsed due to the heat of the suits. Oxygen systems were eventually added to help the actors breathe. Four identical cats were used to portray Jones, the crew's pet. During filming, Sigourney Weaver discovered that she was allergic to the combination of cat hair and the glycerin placed on the actors' skin to make them appear sweaty. 
By removing the glycerin she was able to continue working with the cats. Alien originally was to conclude with the destruction of the Nostromo while Ripley escapes in the shuttle Narcissus. However, Ridley Scott conceived of the fourth act to the film in which the alien appears on the shuttle and Ripley is forced to confront it. He pitched the idea to 20th Century Fox and negotiated an increase in the budget to film the scene over several extra days. Scott had wanted the alien to bite off Ripley's head and then make the final log entry in her voice. But the producers vetoed this idea as they believed the alien should die at the end of the film. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?